Hi, my name is Chris Hooper. I'm an amateur at this stuff, but I do have many years of embedded programming experience. I've owned multiple Amiga models since 1988. What we're looking at here is an Amiga 3000 motherboard Rev9 and daughterboard Rev3. I'm not sure exactly how they ended up getting paired together. This particular Amiga had been sitting in storage for about 25 years and it was in a moist area that resulted in a lot of corrosion on the board. Uh, I cleaned that up and recapped the board. I needed to uh, replace some minor logic ICs that had failed. Recently I bought an XSurf 100 network card and I couldn't get it to work in the Amiga and I wasn't sure what it was. So I spent some time trying to debug the problem and I found that it wasn't the XSurf card that was bad. There's a factory rework fault on the daughter board that was the cause of the issue. And it took quite a bit of debug to figure out exactly what the issue was and I'd like to walk you through how I debugged the problem and then figured out what the issue was with the rework. So since this was a new card and I had no previous experience with the XSurf 100 I wasn't sure if I had the software installed correctly including the TCP IP stack because I was upgrading from an A2065 using the AS225 software. I went to METCP and used the Santa 2 driver for the XSurf 100 version 1.12. I could get it to transmit packets on the network. I could see with TCP dump, the ICP echoes, the packet get sent to the remote host and I did see the reply come back to the Amiga and from there I didn't see any indication that it had received a message and that didn't get me any further so my next step was to try a different card in the computer that maybe I could understand a little better luckily I have a big RAM plus board which should provide an excellent scratch pad area for bus debugging okay the big RAM plus is installed and we see something very interesting right away an expansion board diagnostic screen comes up this big red screen indicates the Big Ram Plus is defective. Now, I know for a fact the Big Ram Plus is not defective because I have another Amiga 3000 and in that Amiga the Big Ram Plus works just fine. So that problem is localized to this Amiga. Now I'm going to click continue and then we're going to poke at this board from Amiga OS. It uh, takes quite a while to boot, so we're going to skip forward here until it's actually completed booting. So now that the Amiga is booted, we'll use Show Config to display the list of boards present. And we see that the Big Ram Plus board is at address 4 and 7 zeros. So we'll use a utility that I wrote that allows us to read and write memory addresses. We'll take a look at that base address. And we see a value there. Now since uh, the Amiga didn't actually end up using this memory or mapping it in, we know we can just feel free to read and write values there. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is try to write all zeros just to see if we've got any stuck ones. and then we'll read it back and we see it's, it's all zeros so that, that seemed to work so let's try writing all ones and take a look at that well that was not so successful so it seems like some nibbles uh, were written successfully but others were not what if we were to say a5, A5, A5. So that's a, a 1 0, 1 0, 1 0, 1 0, 1 0 bit pattern. Yep, still it's pretty consistent. The top nibble and bottom, bottom nibble seem to be always writable. What about 5A, 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 5A? Well, there's something interesting here. It, it accepted all uh, bit values. So we know we don't have any stuck ones, we don't have any stuck zeros because you can see um, we were able to read a, a zero value and we were able to, well it's hard to know, maybe we do have some stuck zeros. 
but definitely uh, the 5A, 5A, 5A value worked. I can write anything to the top byte and it seems to be successful, but if I write anything to bit number 5 in this byte, um, I end up with a problem. So I'm, I'm going to just write a, a 0 in this nibble. I'll write a 0 in the next nibble as well. Once I do that, then it seems like I can write any other value. Oops, let's try that again. And then we'll display. Sure enough, in, in this case, I was able to write all three bytes. And just to test, we'll try again with FFFFF. And now we see at least those bytes are consistently sticking. Now how about an F here? So even that nibble seems to be working. Let's see the high bit. Still good. And just to be sure. Yes, that seems to still be working. In the end, what I found is that this particular bit, when set, doesn't allow us to change some of the other bits. So, for example, I wanted to write 204500. The 45 wasn't accepted by the memory. So that led me to try to track down what's special about this particular bit. And this is bit 21, and um, specifically seems to have some weird effect on write actions to memory. So this got me thinking, well, what, what could cause that? I then went to my oscilloscope, which I'll show you here in a second, and I tried writing that bit just to see what would happen. I, I watched it with the oscilloscope. So I set up my scope to watch that bit 21 out on the Zorro bus, which ends up being ED5. And the easiest way for me to pick that up was at U716, pin 13. You zoom in here, you can take a look at my clip attached to U716, pin 13. I also needed to have a trigger, and so I decided to use the DOE signal on the Zorro bus. The easiest way for me to grab that was on Buster, pin 21. Using that DOE signal, I could then have the oscilloscope trigger on that and it would make it easy for me to watch the analog value of that ED5 pin on the Zero bus when I was driving that bit high or low. So let's move over to the scope now. As previously mentioned, I configured a trigger on DOE. I have the yellow line representing the ED5 signal. And for a point of comparison, I have the purple connected to the ED4 signal. Now, first thing I'm going to do is enable the trigger. And I will now drive both ED4 and ED5 low. And you'll see we get a nice low pulse there on both of them. Now, for some reason, they're hovering at different voltages. ED5 seems to stick somewhere around 3.8, 3.9 volts and ED4 is around 2.04 volts. I don't have a good reason for that, but uh, maybe we'll get to the bottom of that in a bit here. So we've tried writing a zero value to both of those, and we see they both sit right around the same value when they're low. Now let's try driving both of them high. Now we see something that's a little odd. It seems like ED4 did go all the way high, but ED5 didn't quite make it all the way up. Let's now just drive ED4 high and set ED5 low. You can see ED5 is all the way down low. Now we'll do the opposite. We'll set ED5 high and ED4 low. ED4 is definitely low. ED5 really didn't go high. We'll go back to both of them low. We can see it did transition all the way back on. It looks like something is fighting something else on the bus. The problem had to be some sort of a signal short between two wires on the Zorro bus, and it could be anywhere between the chips on the motherboard and the Zorro sockets. After doing a visual inspection of the riser, I decided it's easiest to just start probing out lines on the riser to see if I could figure out where the short might be. I knew that ED5, after looking at the schematics, was 
pin 86 and so what I did is I just quickly walked along all the signals to see if my multimeter would throw a beep at anything nothing on the odds I'm seeing a few pins with uh, pretty low resistance. I imagine that's the uh, the pull-up resistor packs. And here we got a we got a, a 0.7 ohm short between pin 86 and pin 98, and pin 100 is fine. So 86 and 98. Well, here's something interesting. We have a rework that runs to pin 98 up here. Let's just jump up here. And that's going to pin 2 on a resistor pack. Looks like that's RP608. So let's jump over to the schematics and take a look at that. Next we see RP608. Pin 2 is already connected to 86 on all the zero slots where the rework was running pin 2 to 98 well that's a little odd because 98 already has its own pull up so it means that we've got a short here connecting pin 86 to pin 98 by shorting pin 2 of RP608 with pin 98 on the back of the board so back to the daughter board, we need to figure out why this rework was done and if it's even needed. For that I needed to do a little bit of digging on the internet. What I found is a list of motherboard and daughter board revisions and the required rework to bring them up to higher levels. One rework, the RP603 pin 5 to CN603 pin 51 is exactly the other rework we see on the board. But this second one, RP608 pin 2 to CN602 pin 86, where it was actually connected to pin 98. It appears to me that the factory rework was done incorrectly. It should have been attached to pin 98 and instead was 86. Now, if you were to take 86, write it on a piece of paper, and flip that paper upside down, you could see how you might interpret that as a 98 instead of an 86. That's maybe what happened. My next step is to remove the rework from that pin and try the X-Surf 100 again just to see if we can get it working. Alright, so let's drop a little flux down. And we'll just disconnect one side of that rework for now just to see if we can move that connection. Alright, that should be good enough to test. Come back and clean that up in a little bit. The daughter board's been reinserted into the Amiga and I reinstalled the Big Ram Plus. Now we're going to go ahead and power it on and see what happens. Alright, let's take a look at the Amiga with Big Ram Plus. And we'll do the same memory access we did before. We see a value there that Amiga is probably initialized. We'll just step on that. Hopefully it doesn't crash. Looks like that store was successful. This one was not before. Looks good. We'll also take a look at these values we were writing before with the scope. So remember we started out with ED5 and ED4, which are bit 21 and bit 20 as zeros. With the scope, we'll, we'll take a look and see what that looks like first. And the next thing we will write are both of those bits high. So let's move to the scope now. So something noticeable right away on the scope is that both of their steady state values are now the same. Let's Grab a measurement. So they're both sitting around 2.8 volts. That's probably right where they should be with the pull-ups in place. 
that measurement off, back to trigger. So we write that zero value there that we wrote last time. And we see nice zero low voltage. And if we write them both high, sure enough, they're both high. They'll be hard to see on the, on the video, so let's separate them. We'll just write ED4 high and ED5 low. And the other way around, now ED5 is high and ED4 is low. That looks much better. And that rework was pretty certainly done incorrectly. Uh, my next step here will be to try out the network card and see if we can get I.O. going over the network. Okay, we're booting with the XSurf 100 installed. First thing we need to do is start up the METCP stack. Well, let's try to ping a host. Look at that, we're out there pinging a server on the internet. So that's great news. So the last thing I want to do before removing this wire which used to be connected to RP608 pin 2 is verify that pin 2 is correctly connected on the board to pin 86 of all the Zoro slots. So we'll walk those one at a time. And we'll also check the edge connector. That looks good. While I'm here, I think I'll also verify that pin 5 of RP608 does connect to pin 98 of all the zero slots. And also down at the edge connector. Okay, things look good there. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this rework wire, which is apparently not necessary at all. Grab that wire. Clean with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. And just wipe. Alright, I think that looks pretty good. I decided to verify that the rework wire connecting RP603 pin 5 and pin 51 on the Zoro slots was even necessary. So I lifted the rework wire and I'm going to walk along and verify we have connectivity to all the slots. All the way down to the edge connector. So this rework wire isn't necessary either. That's somewhat surprising considering this is a Rev3 motherboard. I don't know if you can see that very well. And according to Commodore's rework list, this would need those reworks. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that rework as well. Alright, looks good. Now just to clean it up a little bit. I hope you find this video helpful, especially if you're having similar problems with your precious electronics. Debugging signaling or logic IC problems can turn out to be much more difficult than this, especially if you don't have access to schematics or diagnostic tools. In this case, I just got lucky and found the cause of the problem rather quickly. Thanks for watching.